Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. We are still at the shop doing projects and shop talk. So we recently ran into some information that said there's people that spend a lot of money for what's called an RV TV. I don't think either of us had heard of an RV TV, but I did look it up. It's real, it's very expensive. But we also ran into people that use a regular TV and they run their inverter with it. And that's what inspired this video. What I really want to go through is the inefficiency of the power conversion from an inverter and from DC to DC converters, and then to describe methods of not using your AC inverter and to replace your power supplies and some of your, app, your, your equipment with a DC to DC converter, of which there are three different types, and, and, and I, I could explain enough of it to help you pick the one that's right for you. I'd like to talk a little bit about power efficiency. There, when you're operating equipment in your camper, you would like to be as efficient as possible because you have a very limited power supply. Your, your limited power supply is your battery. If you don't use it efficiently, then you're going to be finding yourself running your generator more frequently. You're going to find yourself running out of power if you're boondocking. In general, people would like to understand exactly what efficiency they're operating. It really has to do about understanding what's happening in your camper. And, and then there's always the question of efficient relative to what? Something is 75% efficient, is that more or less efficient than the next best thing? And how much does it cost to get something more efficient? Because efficiency is expensive. And, and the reason why I'm talking about expense here is because batteries are expensive, inverters are expensive, and equipment is expensive. So in order to get the right set of equipment for your needs, I'd like to help you to understand a little bit better. In order to talk about power efficiency in a camper, I put this diagram together to help us understand where power comes from, where it goes to, and how efficiently it moves through those places. In general, all of our power is coming from, from our battery system here. We're going to either have lead acid batteries or lithium iron phosphate batteries, and those those batteries normally produce about around what we call 12 volts, but there's actually a range of voltage operation. And there's a couple different ways we can use that power. We can use it as direct current, which, you know, the direct current power flows through our fuse panel, throughout some of our 12 volt outlets or our 12 volt appliances. And if it's used directly, meaning whatever it's powering is a 12 volt piece of equipment and there's no power supply inside that piece of equipment, then we can consider ourselves to be 100% efficient in the use of our power because we're really talking about the power conversions necessary to use the power. The other method that it can happen is, is this DC power can feed into a, a device which actually has an internal power supply. And that internal power supply can have some conversion losses, and all power supplies do have conversion losses, and in most cases your uh, internal power supplies are somewhere between mid 80s to low 90s percent efficiency. So in this particular case we can assume that we're going to be using any power through those devices at an 85 to 93 percent efficient. So this is, this is a fairly efficient realm in the DC environment, and we should consider ourselves lucky if we have a DC piece of equipment that helps us operate fairly efficiently. Uh, but what I think most people do not understand is the efficiency losses when they have an AC piece of equipment. Everybody's got an inverter and inverters are relatively inexpensive and it's inexpensive to buy a large one. So in a lot of cases we're using our battery power into our inverter. We're producing 120 volts from 12 volts and, and we've been told that our inverter efficiency is somewhere around 80, 85 to 93 percent is typically speaking what, what they're talking about. And one of the things that you need to focus on is the fact that most inverters, just turning them on and using no power, they will sit there and they will draw somewhere between 10 and 25 watts. And over the, over the course of a day, um, that consumes quite a bit of, of power. So just multiply that, you know, 100 times 240 watts, you don't, you, you've basically consumed about a quarter of the power in a 100 amp hour battery. So using an inverter is not completely efficient and, and that efficiency is, is a problem. And so what I'm trying to get to 
here is that if you're going to use power from an inverter, it's going to go through your breaker panel, it's going to come out your AC outlets, and you're probably going to provide that power into one of two devices. You're either going to have a direct cord connected device, which is presumably has an internal power supply, or it's going to have some kind of external power supply, which is what I refer to as a wall wart, which is, has some you know, relatively low efficiency. Um, the problems with using both of these is you have an inefficiency at the step of converting it from 12 volt to 120 volt, and you have a yet another inefficiency that occurs when you're inside the appliance because most DC electronics, most electronics use DC power. And so what you have to imagine is, is using this efficiency times this efficiency is going to produce an overall efficiency. And this overall efficiency calculation here, so if you have a very low power consumption, and I'll define lower power consumptions in a minute, and, and then so you're operating at the 88% of your inverter efficiency and times your internal power supply, you might be only operating at 66% overall efficiency, and the lower the power that it consumes, the lower your efficiency goes. And you could, you could find yourself in a situation where you're, you're plugging in a wall wart to, power your, to charge your phone with your inverter, and you're down here at about 25% efficiency, meaning, meaning one part in four is making it into your, into your tele phone charging, and the rest of that three quarters power is just wasted. That seems terrible, but even at the best case, where your, your inverter is now up, you're operating at its 93% efficiency, and your internal power supply might be operating at that at high efficiency, but this 93% efficiency plus this 93% efficiency really results in an overall efficiency of 86%. And if you consider the idle power and in, in present that's required to run your inverter, you might be down as low as 75% overall efficiency. So what I'm trying to impress upon you is running an inverter is, is a big uh, problem if you don't know uh, what range you're operating it in. And so the next sheet here is, is going to take some more of this into account. And we're going to watch the red line here. So this, this diagram comes from the solar industry, and this is, a, this is a ballpark. This doesn't necessarily mean this is your inverter or any of every, anybody's inverter. But there are ranges of efficiencies. If you buy the cheap Chinese inverter, you're going to be down here on the blue line. If you buy your average one, you're going to be up here on the red line. And this yellow line up here only refers to essentially dedicated um, converters that working inside specialized equipment. This is really where your solar charge controller lives because it operates at a high percentage of its capacity. But what I want to really talk about is over here. If you look at the bottom line, this is the ratio of capacity. So even if you have a, if you have a 3,000 watt inverter, your capacity is 3,000 watts, and at 10% or below of that, your efficiency is operating down here in the range. So, so you're you, literally, if you're operating your inverter and you're operating below 10% or even 20% efficiency, you're wasting a tremendous amount of power. And that's really the point here is, is that you never want to turn an inverter on and use it for just a little bit of power. This also goes to the fact if you went out to buy an inverter, you want to buy an inverter not much larger than you really need because you'd like to be operating in this range right here. You'd like to be operating above 30% and above about 90% in your inverter whenever you turn it on. Uh, if you're operating down here, you're wasting most of your power. And that's where uh, it comes to, you know, when you look at your equipment that you've purchased and where it's using its power and how it's using its power, the efficiency of all this conversion process is a very important thing. And so what I want to relate to you is a, is a desire to get away from operating your inverter, especially down here in the less than 10 to 20% range, and look at using other power conversion alternatives to, to making your equipment operate, especially if it's low power. Going back to the uh, issue of, okay, if you, if you think you have to operate it on your inverter and you can find a way around it, the DC operation is up here in the 95 to 100% efficiency range. The AC operation is down here in the, in the, in the 75 to 25% range. And if you're able to find a way to take your device that was powered by AC 
and now power it by an external DC power supply, you can bring the operation of that equipment back into the 85 to 93 percent performance range because you only have one power conversion and not two, and not one that's very inefficient. This is hopefully some uh, new information that will be useful to you in your RV. Uh, there's a lot of folks that uh, buy equipment that run on electric power and that electric power is often managed by some kind of a transformer. We call it a wall wart. Uh, this one I'm specifically going to talk about uh, my, my TV. I have a 32 inch Samsung TV and it is powered by this kind of uh, power supply with a, with a cord on the end and it, and it takes a IEC 320 connector here. Uh, this has been cut off here, but this is, this is the power brick for the TV, and it runs at 19.2 volts. So initially, when I first got it, in order for me to run my TV, I had to have the inverter on, and I'd have to have the inverter on for quite some time if I was going to watch a two-hour movie. I would probably use as much uh, energy just keeping the inverter on as I did actually powering the TV. Uh, and this is kind of a common theme for a lot of equipment that you may purchase is that if it comes with a wall wart, you know, and here's another one, here's another example. Okay, so here is the power supply from my DVD player. And so this, in this particular case, this is a 12 volt power supply. And again, if I needed to watch, wanted to watch a DVD, I had to have the inverter on to power the TV and the DVD player. But this is a 12 volt DVD player, so that, that should be a much easier issue to solve. And so let me talk about some of the solutions that are available. There's a lot of DC to DC converters out there and, and here's probably the one that's you're probably most, most simple and you're most useful uh, used to seeing is this is a uh, 5 volt USB power supply. Well this is a dash mounted, it takes 12 volts, automotive 12 volts in the back and produces a 5 volt regulated uh, supply out the front. Inside of this is a small DC to DC converter. Um, so that's uh, something at least you're familiar with. So moving on from there, so now I, what I have is I have a need to power my television at 19.2 volts, my DVD player at 12 volts regulated power, not 12 volt automotive power, which can, can range anywhere from about 10 and a half volts to about 14 and a half volts. This DVD player will not tolerate uh, more than about from about 11 and a half to about 12 and a half volts. So it needs regulated 12 volt power, not automotive 12 volt power. So, and I want to be able to run these devices anytime I want without having to turn the inverter on. So what brought this up was I was rebuilding what you see in front of you here. This is a this is a DC to DC converter, and this is called a boost converter. This elevates the voltage of any connected supply. So you can see on my on my portable power supply here. I'm running uh, 12 volts into this DC to DC boost converter. And what's coming out of it is 19.2 volts. And that's uh, on this connector right here. Uh, this is what plugs into the TV. So if I want to watch my TV and I have, re and have regular 12 volts, I just flip this switch on and this cord, which I, has been cut off uh, the power supply that it came with, and attached to this DC to DC converter, this DC to DC converter will make 12 volts into 19.2 volts all the time. And so it's also stable. So you notice this is 12 volts in. Well, what happens if my battery charger kicks on and now I'm all of a sudden I'm up to 14.4 14, 14 volts? Well, output is still 19.2 volts. This input will handle virtually any input uh, and it will stay a stable output. So I'll turn it back down now to 12 volts and let's say if it goes down to 10 volts, it's still 19.2 volts. So my sensitive electronic television set wants 19.2 volts, not a little bit more, not a little bit less, and this is exactly what it provides. Um, this power brick would do exactly that, the same thing from 110 volts, but it makes no sense to me to take 12 volts, run it through an inverter, produce 120 volts, run through this converter and bring it back down to 19.2. There's a number of power conversions in there which are just senseless. And so this device here, this is probably about a, this is a 5 amp boost converter that will take any voltage from about 10 volts up to about 35 volts and boost it. Uh, one of the limitations of converters is that you have about a 1 volt or so uh, difference. So this 
boost converter, if you put 12 volts in, about the lowest you can get out of it is 13. It won't function uh, within one volt of its supply voltage. The same thing with a buck converter. So this device right here, this is a, this is a two amp buck converter, and I use a number of these as well. So this is, this is what you could use inside of this. This is a voltage reducing converter. That's what buck infers. You can put 12 volts into this and get any voltage out of it from about 11 and below. Or you can put it, you can put 30 volts into it and get something out uh, far below it. But and it, and on the on the device, you see right here. This is this little screw head right here. This is a variable uh, resistor. And in order to adjust the voltage, you simply you know put your input voltage on and measure the output voltage and turn the screw until you get to the voltage that you want to have. Anyway, the reason why I suggest that this is an important thing for RVers is that. It will keep you from using your inverter to power appliances that can run on DC that can be can be operated. So uh, instead of using that wall wart that the device came with, cut the plug off, get a DC to converter, and set it up to operate to produce the DC voltage that your device needs. It will do it very stably and very uh, inefficiently. And so here's the case. Here is my uh, 12 volt power supply for my DVD player. This is a 12 volt regulated power supply, and it needs to be 12 volt regulated because it needs to have, you know, 12, like say, 11 and a half to 12 and a half volts is where it wants to live. And if it gets up to some of the ranges that's automotive 12 volt experience, it's going to burn it out. Um, and so I have a need to operate a 12 volt device from a 12 volt input. My 12 volt input can vary from 10 and a half to 14 and a half volts. My 12 volt output must only vary between about 11 and a half and 12 and a half. And so you'll notice that the input power range is this broad and the output power range is this broad. And so you can buy a certain type of a converter called a SEPIC converter that can actually provide a good regulated output power uh, at, at a similar range to the input power. Um, and they are, so there are three types. There is the, the uh, boost converter, the buck converter, and, uh, the voltage increasing converter, the voltage reducing converter, and the voltage stabilizing converter is called a SEPIC converter. And it actually, a SEPIC converter is actually two converters put into a single unit. But this equipment is very common and very inexpensive. These, these converters are, you know, single digit dollars. They're not expensive. Uh, and with a little time and a, and a little bit of wire and a little soldering iron, you can have yourself set up so you can be a, have a very efficient uh, power system within your camper. sneaking into the camper. I'm like running away from home. Hey honey, can you make me some popcorn? <laughs>